Well, you're all very welcome this morning, and I'm very pleased to be here today as Chair of the Joint Directors Committee on Housing, Planning and Local Government. Our Vice Chair, Deputy Pat Casey, unfortunately isn't able to be here, and he sends his apologies also. Um, this morning's launch is the report examining the potential impact of Brexit on Ireland's housing market. And on behalf of the Joint Committee, I would like to thank all the witnesses who came before the committee and participated in an engaging and informative discussion on the topic. I would also like to thank all the stakeholders that issued written submissions to the committee. The respective contributions provided uh, great insight on the matter, and I'm glad to see so many of them here with us today. I would also like to thank the committee secretariat, who are also the, the quiet unsung heroes who put together this report and worked so closely with the committee members in, in supporting us in that manner. Um, with the UK soon to withdraw from the European Union, the committee felt it would be wise. Fergus, a seat here. The committee felt it would be wise to examine what effect this may have on Ireland's housing market, as the country is currently tackling a housing shortage, and any potential adverse impact on the market is worth investigating and highlighting. The job of the committee is to oversee the work of the department. And it is our responsibility to assist the department to ensure that uh, make them aware of any of the potential problems that may be caused by Brexit. We are trying to strengthen the policies of the department by highlighting these issues. Morning, Grace. Uh, hopefully, this report will go some way to start this important discussion and help in preparing the housing sector in Ireland for life after Brexit. The report itself covers what the committee see as the most pressing areas of concern for the housing sector in Ireland's post-Brexit. As I am sure everyone can appreciate, and with the nature of Brexit itself, the exact outcomes and the extent of its impact are hard to judge at this point in time. The Committee has, however, attempted to provide a well-rounded assessment of potential impacts and has made some recommendations which may help lessen the impact on our housing sector. It is not saying that rebuilding Ireland is not working, but it is saying that new barriers to trade that are outside the control of the Department could potentially affect the results if materials are not readily available. The report primarily deals with the following three areas. The potential population changes that we forecast, building costs and completion times, and the future of the housing market post-Brexit. Brexit may induce demographic changes in Ireland, less people may emigrate, more people may move to Ireland, and within Ireland people may further draw to our urban centres. Changes in migration patterns are something that the Department has been planning for, and however, in light of Brexit, it is something which we feel needs close, ongoing scrutiny. In relation to building costs and completion times, simply put, any additional barriers that are, are created, which impinges on the availability of construction products or skilled workers, will increase building costs and may delay construction completion times. The Department is already working with a number of UK notified bodies to offset this issue, and that was one of our key recommendations. The Committee has also included a short chapter on the future of the housing market post-Brexit. Inevitably, this is the most difficult element to predict. The Committee did, however, agree that the country needs to continue investing in social housing during periods of economic growth and during any future downturn that may occur. The Joint Committee, in consultation with the relevant ministers, departments, state agencies and stakeholders, is fully committed to monitoring the progress being made on the ongoing implementation of the recommendations contained in the report about Brexit, as well as other policy initiatives in this area. I believe that the recommendations in the report constitute a set of timely constructive proposals, and I know that the Department is alert to the challenges posed by Brexit and is working to mitigate the adverse impacts. Finally, I hope that this report is the beginning of a robust conversation on how Brexit will impact our housing sector. So can I thank you all for your attendance this morning, and I don't know if some of the members might want to say a few words around the report, and then we'll go to questions. Owen, did you want to say anything? Not especially. Um, I mean, look, it, one of the valuable things about producing the report was that the public hearings that we did, and they're obviously available to anybody online, it was important that we heard from industry, from uh, unions, from uh, uh, the department and others. Uh, and I think one of the biggest concerns that was expressed to us, which is very strong in the report, is that given that both the supply of housing uh, and the affordability of housing are two of our biggest challenges, anything that disrupts either of both of those is a problem. And therefore, there has to be clear contingency planning uh, in place. Some of us were concerned at committee that uh, while everybody was aware of the risks, 
the level of, of such contingency planning wasn't where it needed to be. And I think one of the things we're hoping is this really shines a, a spotlight on that so that everybody who's involved in this is clearly focused on, as Maria says, any disruption to labour supply, any disruption to supply chains, any increase of costs of finance and materials could have a knock-on effect on the supply and the affordability of much-needed housing. And a particular government needs to be alert to that and make sure there's adequate mitigation measures. So, uh, I want to endorse what the, the Chair said, both about committee members, but also in particular about the Secretariat, uh, who put huge work into the report, and uh, hopefully it does spark that debate. Thanks, Alan. Victor? Yeah, I suppose I'd, I also endorse the two previous speakers, and I suppose just to focus on one particular issue that came over very clear from the stakeholders and those who engaged in this process was the whole issue of the potential skill shortages that will be associated uh, with, with Brexit, potential fallout of all of that, but also the need for training, apprenticeships, and be it practical, technical training that we would have seen people coming through into the workforce, but also graduates in terms of engineering. And we've really identified a shortage in the construction sector in terms of workforce, but also in the training. So there's a lead-in in terms of training people going forward, and that's important. And we've already identified that as part of the Rebuilding Ireland, and one of the difficulties that will have to be encountered and planned for. But I think it became really more in, into focus uh, during our discussions and with the stakeholders and the people who engage with the committee, this need to plan out for the future and also to provide for people who want to come back with such skills. And again, where, where we have areas of shortage of housing, we also have very, very high rental, and that's come through from our research. And again, so people who want to come back want to know they can come back and live. Initially, they'll rent. And possibly purchase. So there's, 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 there's conflicting issues there, but we identified that as a really strong issue. How do we encourage people to come back in who are professional and skilled back into, into the workforce in Ireland, but also how do we plan going forward for training for apprenticeships in the construction industry? So there are two key recommendations of the 14 recommendations in this report, and I, I just want to say I think it was a very meaningful engagement, and I think we were right to keep the focus on those key 14 messages. So again, I want to thank the Chair, and I want to thank the Committee, who were very much driving this whole initiative at in the beginning. Thank you. Thanks, Victor. Jennifer? Yeah, just to agree with Victor and Owen, I think, as we all know, we're, we're in what I would say is, is a housing crisis, and I think Brexit, um, the knock-on effect of that can be absolutely critical to Ireland. And particularly, I would always focus on rural Ireland, because as someone that has lived outside Dublin, and a lot of our committee meetings have been based, and witnesses have come from Dublin, which is very welcome, but rural Ireland has a massive part to play. And part of this um, report is about the type of housing, particularly in the likes of rural Ireland, where you need to look at small houses, maybe cooperative housing, because it's all about the houses that are being built now that I feel is the issue and of course we all know there's the lack of um, housing which is particularly in the lack of local authority housing so we need to look at housing we need to look at our particular our trades people that they're not leaving we have a lot of emigration still and that has become a massive problem because we cannot keep people in our own country whether it's through any kind of apprentice a bricklayer electrician and um, a welder like these are all people that we are losing and we're losing them and I sometimes wonder about the figures because particularly again I will go back to my own area of rural Ireland there are areas, I feel, that have been far more affected by the housing crisis in the sense of the build. And I think part of this programme definitely, and this, this uh, report, is definitely um, highlighting the issues that we have. Um, I also feel that we need to look at maybe, you know, the, the, the report says about... Um, how do we get this done in time? Now, the main thing is, for me, time scale. How are we going to commit to getting timescale? Because, I mean, I, I love to, we all love to be launching our reports and we, we all work so hard as a committee, and in particular to Maria, who has been working so hard. But we need to do it, and we need to do it now. We, we cannot wait any longer now for what has happened. We cannot have any more homelessness. But in particular now with Brexit, we cannot afford to not build houses, to not get people to stay in their own country where they're born and bred so that they will keep generating our Irish community and that's what we need to do. We need to focus on like Dublin and the rural, the rural area. So that would be a, a, an area for me and I've said this to Marie and I've said this to the Minister. We need to put proposals there that we can commit to and we can do now. 
We don't want to be back here next year again or the year after, hopefully, that we won't be asking for time scale. We need to focus on time, we need to focus on trade, we need to focus on promoting what we have and making it. And I'm, I'm, all, I'm a firm believer in local. When you are local, I always think it's nice to promote local. I think it's nice to promote local businesses and I think it's nice to give to your own community. And I think as part of this housing, whether you're in Dublin, whether you're in rural Ireland or whatever parts of the country you're from, it's always nice to keep promoting your own area and also making sure that you try and keep as much work as you can in your area and I think that's, that, that needs to be done. So there is, great, there is actually great initiatives in this report and I, and I want to say well done to everybody. Thanks Jennifer. Audrey? Yes, thank you Chair and I want to thank you Chair for all your hard work and endeavours <coughs> and indeed other members and of course the Secretariat and post-Brexit, are we ever going to be post-Brexit is the problem, you, we don't know where we are. <laughs> and, and I think we'd like to post it and post it away somewhere that we could forget about it. But no, I mean, the, the huge issues with, with tradespeople is one aspect that I know. And I'm delighted that we have a new centre in Tipperary open in Tullers now, with the ETB, uh, the, the, the art town in Tullers, where they're, they're taking in tradespeople, uh, young people who want to be tradespeople, mm. and older people, to reskill them and give them the trades. And it's a good location because it's a, it's a, a real estate from all over the country and um, stops and tunnels, so it's vital. I have people involved, I'm involved in construction into myself, but I had nephews and people that were abroad, and some of them came back to Dublin in recent years, just walking down the road here, the big developments. But they could not get back their cousins and their friends that wanted to come back. And they were in a position to hire, they were in that, in that area, they were, and um, because they couldn't afford to live in Dublin. They wanted to come back, and, and, but they couldn't afford. And they're driving from my county in Tipperary to Dublin in the morning. I don't know how to do it, five days a week. So we need to look at that. Well, all the building is, unfortunately, 90% of it is taking place in Dublin. We need to, 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 to get it out into the regions, and we need to have more uh, for joint up thinking. And make it easy for people to, 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 to want to be able to build, to have a site, to want to build in the country, uh, to alleviate the housing crisis. They're not, they can't get planning, and, and sometimes they can't get, sometimes they can't get the financial agencies to give them the money. And they are, you know, two, two, two working people in the family, and they could do this. And we mustn't stifle that because that always played a, a very important part in housing our people, especially in, in, in urban and rural. But we need to uh, compliment everyone involved, and look, we need to make it, make it, make it happen. Thank you. Thanks, Matty. Uh, Fergus. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Um, I'm chairman of the Transport Committee as well as being a member of this particular committee. So we discussed actually yesterday the impact of Brexit on transport. It will be hugely significant. And I agree with the findings of the committee here that it will have a significant impact, obviously, clearly, on getting your, your product through one way or the other. It, it, if there are long delays, and there's, there are likely to be delays, uh, it, it, it will, in fact, obviously increase costs. So I think having that line of communication or that, you know, it, there won't be a just-in-time flow chart anymore to be make sure, you know, you, people will be stockpiling, I'd say, rather than anything else. But the one point I would like to say is that uh, there are more houses being built now than have been in previous years, <laughs> notwithstanding the significant issues in relation to housing supply. And I agree with the comments about the skills shortages, but I feel that in one sense, uh, you know, Brexit, if I'm a worker in, in Eastern Europe or wherever, and if I'm looking at Britain and I'm looking at, you know, Ireland in terms of coming with my family to work, I'm, I think you'll have a significant increase, I believe, in people with skills, with building skills, choosing Ireland above the UK, particularly if there's a hard Brexit. And obviously why that would meet the skill shortages and critically they're identified the 80,000 workers we would need in the coming years. I think that would be helpful in that regard, but I do think that obviously, clearly, that will have a built-in uh, demand for housing. And the first recommendation the committee made, and to me it's hugely important, and it should apply universally, I think, is, is rent pressure zones. I think rent pressure zones, particularly, uh, I live in Drogheda, it's a rent pressure zone, it's working there. Uh, you know, it, it is controlling rents, and I think places like Dundalk and RD should also be considered for rent pressure zones uh, where, where the pressure would be. Thank you. Thank you, Fergus. We actually had a great meeting with the Minister yesterday around uh, rent, the rental tenancy bill, but we're going to that again. Grace, do you say a couple of words? Sure. Um, apologies. I have a bit of a cold. I stood out with the nurses the other day and walked for an hour and a half in the rain and wind, so I got uh, rained upon, but that was nothing to what the, the nurses are facing themselves and, and the efforts they're making to try to get recognition and to um, get
get some kind of communication flow going. But um, I welcome the report. I think anything that can be done in terms of uh, trying to um, uh, look at contingency planning. Um, if you think of what the Girl Guides say, be all of, be prepared. And in as much as no one can be prepared for Brexit, we really do not know what the, the extent of what's coming down the line is. There is um, a hard Brexit um, in terms of regulation, housing, everything. The impact is going to be absolutely enormous. So a report like this, it, it's only, it, it's just giving a sense of what might be. That's all it's doing. It's not, it's not the be all and the end all. It, um, the witnesses who came in and the work that the chair has uh, compiled uh, is, to my mind, to be welcomed. It's only an indication. Uh, it's, it's giving some recommendations. Hopefully it will be considered. And uh, as I said, no one knows what's coming down the line. But at least this is some effort to be uh, considerate and prepared. Thanks, Grace. I'll open it up to the floor, and you might just identify yourself um, if you have any questions to ask. Are there any questions to the committee? Alan? Hi, uh, Alan Barr from the ESRI. Uh, first, congratulations on the report. And in looking through the recommendations, one of the things that struck me is that uh, this issue touches on every other area of policy, almost. I um, mean, you have sort of things here about avoiding the bust to boom cycle, which is really all about macroeconomics. You talk about skills training, which is education, transport. So anyway, I could sit here and ask loads of questions, but I'm going to try and restrict myself uh, to one. And it's the issue of attracting uh, skilled workers back to Ireland. I suppose my question is, I mean, is, is there a, a, a a, a, a specific policy proposal on this, and the reason I ask this is that it always sort of strikes me it's very hard to ring fence a particular group of people and sort of say, well, we need obviously we need construction workers, but I mean, you know, we need lots of other people as well. It's also the case that in an economy that's booming, such as the Irish economy, we'd normally expect wages to be increasing, and so you know people are naturally attracted back into an economy. And picking up something Deputy uh, Brass said, I guess the big constraint about people coming back to uh, Ireland is the fact that Dublin is very very expensive, uh, but this kind of links with the idea that we really need to be uh, building houses outside of Dublin, and is there the sort of natural match then that if we could actually sort of rebalance the, uh, the, the, the construction sector, rebalance uh, economic development generally, uh, that you would have construction workers building places uh, outside uh, of Dublin. So sorry, that's a bit of a mangle of a question, I know. But, I think the 2040 <laughs> development, you know, the, the national plan, uh, 2040 plan is identified <coughs> Uh, places like Drogheda, Dundalk, Athlone, Sligo as growth centres outside of the main cities. Uh, so I think that will itself drive policy and, and obviously make places significantly identified by that plan uh, for growth areas outside of the cities. That should certainly uh, help somewhat in the point that uh, meeting those, those needs outside of the major urban areas. Uh, Fergus has, has picked up writing on that, so we have the Rebuilding Ireland, which is the policy that underpins everything that we're doing in delivery around housing across all sectors, but then on the other side it's the 2040 plan, I'm delighted Paul Hogan is here from the authors of that plan, and it's the overarching uh, plan for what's permission in principle, what environment we're creating, and that's underpinned then by the infrastructure um, agreement of 116 million over a number of years to develop that infrastructure, whether that be transport integration, whether that be recreational, cultural, housing, commercial, whatever that may be, and er, through urban regeneration funding, through LIHAP funding, opening up other sites outside of Dublin so that Dublin doesn't become a pressure point. And then we had the Charter Surveyors in Engineers Ireland in who said that they are actively pursuing people coming back to Ireland. And it was the, the, one of the recommendations around that was to help them in whatever way we kind of <coughs> open-ended so that the department could look at ways of encouraging and supporting them to attract business and skilled workers back into Ireland here. And 2040, well, it's a statutory plan, but it, it's a roadway to permanent and consistent development for the next 20 years. And in order to entice people back here, they need to know there's not going to be another boom bust cycle in construction. They need to know there's continuity of employment. And they need to know it's a place that um, is going to be continually developing. So I think 2040 encompasses all that. And that's the certainty that will underpin, hopefully, people uh, coming back home. Owen? Yeah, I suppose the, the straight answer to your question is affordable housing. Um, uh, and we're currently uh, midway through uh, another committee report looking specifically at the issue of affordable housing. But that gap between... 
uh, wages and and uh, uh, the cost of accommodation is, is growing again uh, and growing very very significantly. Uh, John O'Connor uh, has made from the housing agency has made a very compelling case to our committee that unless you have a very very large investment in, in affordable cost rental accommodation, whether by the not for profit sector or the public sector, you're not going to fill that gap. Uh, and in fact, at the housing agency conference, the, the senior economist from Sherry Fitzgerald actually said that private sector rental investment isn't going to be able to meet. Uh, that segment of, of the workforce, certainly in the next kind of two to five years. Uh, uh, so certainly you're asking me my opinion, uh, unless we have a significant supply of genuinely affordable accommodation to rent and to purchase, it's going to be very, very difficult. Now, uh, I partly agree with Jennifer that we obviously need to ensure that those regional centres uh, uh, have uh, adequate accommodation. But what we also have to do, and this is consistent with the National Development Plan and the National Planning Framework, we have to provide good quality affordable accommodation within our urban centres, uh, and Dublin in particular. Uh, I have to say, the St Michael's uh, um, uh, Inchicore project, I think, is going to be a real game changer, because there you have Dublin City Council with the European Investment Bank investing in good quality public housing to meet social and affordable housing need. And I think if we can get projects like that up and running on a greater scale, that's going to make the challenge you're raising a lot easier to tackle. The difficulty, of course, is that takes time, yeah. and time is something we don't really have. Thanks, Alan Gray. And then just following on, uh, <coughs> coupled with affordable, decent <coughs> the services around that. So, for instance, I lived in the, the Netherlands for years, you know, and you see how they do things in terms of um, building construction and how they put these services, infrastructure, they, they wrap it around the, the services, so the education centres, the community centres, and then the housing goes in. So that when the, let's say, affordable or, or decent housing is put in, that, that you have that whole wraparound service, good uh, uh, transport network. Um, so, I mean, if we want to encourage people to come back into this country, particularly people who have lived in, um, in, in good uh, economies and uh, with good uh, social systems and uh, services, uh, we need to, to have that on offer too. So we need to show that it's not just that you can come back and afford your house, but you can school your children, you can look to apprentices, third level, you can look to um, uh, elderly people, good uh, social facilities, um, and I suppose the thing of today, is, is good uh, hospital service, good, you know, that it, it's, it's not just that people come and they bed them down, themselves down in a house, there's so much more uh, that's necessary, and that I think was part of your question, is it's, all of, it's not just housing, it's everything that you wrap around, um, and that's what we have to work for. Yep. And then uh, finalising that then is the Land Development Agency and the establishment of that and the certainty that on state land that a minimum of 40% will be social and affordable. That is a game changer when it comes to affordability. And they outlined how they're going to de-risk sites in order to get them up and running. So th there's a lot being done around here. And like anything with housing, there isn't one quick answer to it, as, as you know, Alan. It, it, it all goes off into various nervous... <coughs> um, I, we hope we, we covered some of your, your question there for us. Are we any other questions? Sure. Um, just on the contingency plans, just from your um, engagement with the Minister and the officials, um, how advanced do you think contingency planning is? Um, I mean, I know this is a recommendation from you guys, but obviously seven weeks out, do you, we have any detail on how far along those contingency plans are to protect things like the material supplies and cross-border labour? And then just a second point. In the report, and it's kind of separate from Brexit, there's just a concern mentioned about the effect of the on the rental sector um, going forward. Can somebody just tease through, I suppose, the thinking for me behind that as what is the concern about HAP and what it might do down the line? So if I start from your last question there, HAP, what you read in that report is that there is an alternative to HAP. And the HAP, as always, with every building or anything, and with the committee, is an interim measure while we get supply up and running. So nobody is saying that HAP isn't working or is working. There's over nearly 47,000 people avail of that and it's been quite successful in uh, people acquiring secure tenancies, although there has been some that haven't. Um, and we met yesterday with the Minister when it came to the rental tenancy bill and securing tenancies and giving more certainty for landlords and tenants and rent pressure zones. There's a huge amount of work that has been done around that and very positive ongoing engagement with the Department and the Minister around rent pressure zones and rent the rental sector in totality. So I, I, I read a line or two this morning in the paper that was I think misconstrued 
So uh, <coughs> we're, we're not coming up with alternatives to HAP. We're just simply saying that is an interim measure while we get supply up and running. Um, when it comes to your other question when you had about labour, and Sarah Neary is here from the department actually as well, when it comes to contingency planning, there is ongoing talks with UK bodies that have relocated here or are about to relocate here so that they can be certified, their products can be certified here. Um, so they're doing a huge amount of work to offset those implications that could increase the cost of materials or increase the time, which in effect would then um, <coughs> delay projects happening. So there's a huge amount of work that is already happening that we're, we've been made aware of from the department when it comes to contingency planning. But what we're planning for is something that we were not we don't know the, the totality of what is coming down the line. So the feeling on this was we're planning for worst case scenario and work our way back and that's the mentality behind this. Do you want to come in? Yeah, look, and some of these issues we don't agree on as a committee um, and it's important I suppose that what the report deals with is, is those areas that we do. Um, we have strongly divergent views on half but I'm not going to bore you with the, the detail of that because that's for another day. But I suppose one, one of the, 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 the concerns is whether you think HAP is a good thing or not. The greater the level of HAP within the <coughs> rental sector, that then has an impact on prices and that has an impact yeah. on people who aren't eligible for HAP. And that's just that's a reality. There is also a growing gap in many parts of the country or in Dublin for certain types of households between HAP levels and, and market rents. And they're just concerns that we have and, and that we raise and that's separate to, to the detail of HAP. On the contingency planning, this is probably an area where there is some disagreement between members of the committee. Um, one of the things that struck me when we had industry and unions in, um, and, and they shared concerns in terms of, of the risk factors, uh, I asked uh, their organisations, were they actively involved with government in developing contingency plans to deal with those things? Uh, and they said no. Um, so while they had been consulted by the department in terms of their views at an earlier stage in terms of the risks, certainly I came away from, from the committee meetings with the impression that the actual contingency planning, and it is difficult as Maria says because you don't know what's going to happen, but that there wasn't active involvement of the sectors who are actually delivering houses, whether they're financing them, building them or, or, or providing the workforce. And that would be a concern for me, certainly. Um, and again, I think that's one of the reasons why we emphasise that in the report. And uh, just, I, I just want to agree with Owen on that. And I'll just go back to the HAP. And the biggest issue that we have, and a lot of us have concerns about um, on the committee, is on the rent pressure zones to do with HAP. There are certain areas don't qualify. So if, if, if you look at the, the 31 local authorities, not all of them are in the rent pressure zone. That becomes a problem. And it becomes a problem when your neighbour has the rent pressure zone. And uh, the town where I am in Carlow, that is not in the rent pressure zone like others. So that's an area that the minister does need to look at because it seems unfair that when you actually give a rent pressure zone to certain areas and you don't to other areas, it does, it does have a knock-on on effect. House prices will go up in the area where there's no rent pressure zone in. And that's where the HAP is affected. So that is an an area and in fairness the minister said he is addressing it but that was one of my big concerns um, with the minister when the rent pressure zone was brought in to do with the HAP that certain <coughs> local authorities weren't in it and others were. I just want to point that I very much favour HAP. Uh, it works because it meets it meets a need if families can't pay the rent if there's a shortage of housing uh, HAP fills that gap and obviously the, uh, it, as, as supply increases uh, there will be less demand for housing, there will be less competition. So I would see HAP would, would trail off because uh, rents will actually go down. And that's, it, it's a supply and demand market and HAP meets that gap. And I think it meets it very successfully. And it means that the ordinary family uh, who wouldn't at all be able to pay the rents, if you look at Drogheda, they would up from about eight, eight, 900 per month up to 12, 1300 in the space of two or three months before the rent pressure zones came in. And, and they would never have been able, people wouldn't have been able to get a house. Uh, but now, they, well, they, I'm not saying there's enough housing, there isn't, but at least they can pay the rent, which they wouldn't have been able to up to now without that. And I think that's, that's yeah. good. And it is that interim measure where we yeah. get supply up and running. And what we do know as of June last year, there was planning permission granted for almost 27,000 homes. So continuously, yeah. the figures are going in the right direction. And to be on target by 2021 <coughs> to have 25,000 homes delivered. So it's, it's in term while we get supply up and running. So any other questions? 
made it too easy for us. Thank you. You're doing a great job. Amazing, great job. Ever, ever. But I thank everybody for their attendance this blessed. morning, and in particular the committee. And we are a cross political committee, but in general, I, I think it's fair to say we all leave our political allegiance at the door, and we try. We all want the same outcome. We differ in how we want to get there, but we always try and reach a consensus. And I think that's what this report outlines here. So it's about in the greater good is what we're always trying to do here without sounding cliche, but um, I want to thank the committee members for the extraordinary work they put in and for all the witnesses that came either physically or gave us submissions. And in general, our witnesses are repeat offenders. They're continuously at our committee and we've built up um, great relationships with numerous stakeholders. And I think that benefits us as, as a whole um, in putting forward policy ideas and suggestions and working with the department in tandem. So thank you very much for attending this morning. And again, to thank the committee secretariat and, and Alan for organising this morning. Well done, well done Chairperson. Well done, Marie. Thank you.